Well, good morning, everyone. And welcome to God's house on now this third Sunday in the season of Advent. And we're so happy that you're here and that we can join all our voices in praising our Savior and our King, Jesus Christ. Today, specifically, we're going to focus on our epistle lesson. So we're going to be looking at the book of James. And in a word, what he encourages all of us is to be, maybe two words, be patient. Okay? And having said that, we all understand in our own human natures that when bad times come our way and frustrations and so forth and whatever forms and, and however intense, we oftentimes become very impatient until whatever it is that's frustrating us is gone. But in our epistle today, James encourages Christian patience. And to apply that in all situations, but especially in times of suffering. Because the Lord and his coming, second one, is near. So he wants us to keep that at the forefront of our minds in all that we're doing. But in especially in how we're living our Christian faith. Because I'll mention here in a moment, you know, it's our time here on earth that grows short. As well as the time of earth itself. So we're going to be talking more about that as our our Lord's uh, glorious kingdom is at hand. And in reality, it's already a part of our lives. But we'll be talking about it in our sermon today under the theme, Be Patient Until the Coming of the Lord. So we're using our chorale service uh, today for our order of service. Most of our service takes place uh, from your bulletin. And we'll begin with our opening worship Uh, or excuse me, our opening hymn uh, as we begin our worship with hymn 106. And you'll note there we're singing verses 1 through 4. So as you can see here, we have now lit three candles. We have the candle of watchfulness, the candle of uh, preparedness, and now we've turned to the candle of great joy, reminding us that we do in fact have a lot of joy uh, in our hearts, knowing that our great substitute has come and he's already won our salvation. And it's that same Jesus who's coming again to ultimately wipe out sin and death and even the devil himself as he ushers in, according to his promise, a new heaven and a new earth where we're going to dwell together for eternity. 
And so in our Advent journey, you can see the pace now is starting to uh, quicken. You can see the sanctuary has uh, begun to change here in its appearance, and there'll be more changes coming as the celebration of his first coming draws near. But more importantly, what we're looking for is, or looking at, maybe that's the right way to say it, is his promises being fulfilled. You know, uh, we're now on this side of Christ's life, death, and resurrection. And we can sense the anticipation of Advent because we can look at those promises that have already been fulfilled for us. Think of what it must have meant for those who had longed for the fulfillment of that very first coming of the Messiah and how excited everyone was, especially the shepherds, you know, the, the low lowlifes of that culture. And here the angels appear to them and tell them that Christ has been born. And they were so excited. And oh, how we share also in that excitement as we await the second coming of that same Messiah. Because at that time, the joy that we will experience won't even compare to the joy that those first Christians experienced. Anyway, in response to that joy of our Lord's coming, I would now have you turn to uh, hymn 63. Is that up there? Yep. Hymn 63, and let's sing verses 1 and 2. So let us begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In that name, the name of the triune God, and with that faith, as dear children approaching a loving parent, as sinners redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, as believers filled with the Holy Spirit, let us confess our sins to Almighty God. Most merciful God, we have been unworthy and disobedient children. We have ignored our Father's admonitions, disregarded our Savior's instructions, and grieved the Holy Spirit. We are not worthy to be called children of God, but we beg you of your fatherly compassion by your saving merits and at your inviting call to have mercy on us and grant us your forgiveness. God so loved the world that he gave his only Son that whoever believes in him might not perish but have eternal life. To those who believe in Jesus Christ, the Heavenly Father gives the Holy Spirit that they may be children of God. Rejoice in the Lord. Your sins are forgiven. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So back to hymn 106 as we sing that final verse together, verse 5.
For our prayer of the day, we pray this together as printed in your bulletin. Hear our prayers, Lord Jesus Christ, and come with the good news of your mighty deliverance. Drive the darkness from our hearts and fill us with your light. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. So now we turn our attention to the written Word of God uh, that has been assigned for this third Sunday in Advent and which has also been inserted in your bulletin. So our first lesson, our Old Testament lesson, comes to us from Isaiah 35, beginning with verse 1. And here the Lord speaks through the prophet Isaiah and declares, The wilderness and the desert will be glad. The wasteland of the Arabah will rejoice and blossom like a crocus. It will bloom lavishly, and there will be great joy in singing. The glory of Lebanon will be given to it. It will be excellent like Carmel and Sharon. They will see the glory of the Lord, the majesty of our God. Strengthen the weak hands and make the shaky knees steady. Tell those who have a fearful heart, be strong. Do not be afraid. Look, your God will come with vengeance. With God's own retribution, he will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind will be opened, and the ears of the deaf will be, un deaf will be unplugged. The crippled will leap like a deer, and the tongue of the mute will sing for joy. Waters will flow in wilderness and streams in the wasteland. The burning sand will become a pool, and in the thirsty ground there will be springs of water. There will be grass, reeds, and rushes where the haunts of jackals once lay. A highway will be there, a road that will be called the Holy Way. The impure will not walk there. It will be reserved for those who walk in that Holy Way. Wicked fools will not wander onto it. No lion will be there, nor will any ferocious animals go up on it. They will not be found there, but only the redeemed will walk there. Then those ransomed by the Lord will return. They will enter Zion with a joyful shout, and everlasting joy will crown their heads. Happiness and joy will overtake them, and sorrow and sighing will flee away. This is the word of our Lord. This time we'll have our special music. I didn't let Mary know ahead of time that that's because I'm, oh, I didn't announce it, did I? Okay. Sorry, Mary. Uh, James is the, the, the scripture reading from James is what we're going to be uh, focusing on during the sermon. So it will be read at that time.
So our gospel lesson this morning is taken from Matthew's gospel, chapter 11, beginning with verse 2, and I invite you to rise for the gospel reading. So Matthew records for us that while John was in prison, he heard about the things Christ was doing. He sent two of his disciples to ask him, Are you the coming one, or should we wait for someone else? Jesus answered them, Go, report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cured, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the gospel is preached to the poor. Blessed is the one who does not take offense at me. As these two were leaving, Jesus began to talk to the crowds about John. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? What did you go out to see? A man dressed in soft clothing? No. Those who wear soft clothing are in king's houses. So what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you. And he is much more than a prophet. This is the one about whom it is written. Look, I am sending my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way before you. Amen, I tell you. Among those born of women, there has not appeared anyone greater than John the Baptist. Yet whoever is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. This is the gospel of our risen Lord. And so let us now confess our Christian faith together expressed through the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated as we continue then with our sermon hymn, Hymn 107.
the peace, grace, and mercy of our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ, as well as our Heavenly Father, be with each and every one of you. Amen. Now allow me to pause for just a moment and explain something to you. I've been serving the Lord in the public ministry for almost 37 years, with most of those years from this pulpit. And virtually all of my sermons, there are some exceptions, but most of them have begun with a blessing upon you before the sermon begins. Now I totally understand, because I'm human too, how after hearing the many forms of that blessing at the beginning of so many sermons, that that initial blessing sometimes begins to sound like the parents on a Charlie Brown TV special. Wah, 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 wah. But I want you to know and to understand that with those words and blessing that are being spoken to you, they come because you are about to hear a message from God. Now, I'm not claiming to be God, but you're about to hear a message from God himself from his written word. And that blessing then is directed toward all of you, to your ears and to your heart, because God wants you to be attentive and receptive to his word and message. So with that said, and with that in mind, receive his blessing once again. The peace, grace, and mercy of God our Heavenly Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, be and abide with all of you. Amen. Now, as I've mentioned already, we're going to turn our attention to our epistle lesson to the book of James. But you're going to notice something, I think, maybe right off the bat, of the contrast between the exuberant joy that we heard of our Old Testament lesson to James, who urges us to temper just a bit our joyful anticipation of the Lord's return with patience and firmness as we undergo our individual trials from day to day in this life. And so, for encouragement, in the face of suffering, James points us to the examples of the prophets who persevered in hardship. And in their lives, as is in our lives, the Lord's compassion and his mercy bring blessings. Now, with that understanding, we turn to the book of James, chapter 5, beginning with verse 7, and you're certainly welcome to follow along with the scripture that's been inserted in your bulletin. Here's what James writes. He says, Therefore, brothers, be patient until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the valuable harvest from the ground, patiently waiting for it until it receives the early and late rain? You be patient too. Strengthen your hearts because the coming of the Lord is near. Do not complain about one another, brothers, so that you will not be judged. Look, the judge is standing at the doors. Brothers, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord as an example of suffering with patient endurance. See, we consider those who endured to be blessed. You have heard of the patient endurance of Job and have seen what the Lord did in the end because the Lord is especially compassionate and merciful. Thus our text and we pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for your amazing love and patience. We pray that you would fill our hearts with that same love and compassion along with a healthy dose of your patience as we await your glorious return. In your name we do pray. Amen. So dear brothers and sisters in Christ, what is taking so long? Ever had that thought cross your mind? 
or maybe those words escaping from your lips while you're waiting in a parking lot for a family member to return? They said it would just be a quick stop, take five minutes. And 20 minutes later, you're still sitting there and you're wondering what is taking so long? I've never experienced that myself, but no, that's not true. There was that one time. I'm just kidding. And I'm guessing that you can immediately see this example and how it connects to the words that we just heard from the Apostle James. James is encouraging his own congregation to be patient as they wait for our Lord's return. And that's necessary advice because Jesus' return seems to be taking a lot longer than even the early church originally expected. Believers of our present generation also need that same encouragement. So today, we try to take to heart as uh, the Lord strengthens us with this encouragement of James, and that uh, that being... Be patient until the coming of the Lord. And that involves, believe it or not, practice. Practicing patience with people and practicing patience with pain or frustrations. Things going on in our lives that do not make us happy. Now, patience is one of those things that is really, really easy to encourage, but oftentimes not so easy to accomplish. Our sinful human natures gets frustrated very quickly when what we expect and what we're experiencing doesn't line up according to our timetable. And so it becomes hard for us to wait, sometimes even an extra five or ten minutes becomes hard. So as much as our brains might want to agree with what James here is teaching, our hearts and our emotions often struggle to get in line with that teaching. So the first thing that James points out to us, as well as to his congregation, is that we want to be sure that we don't become too short-sighted in our waiting. And to illustrate that, what does James do? Well, he he puts before us the timeless example of the farmer who knows that seed doesn't just turn into mature fruit overnight. Each day, the growth and the progress, it's happening, isn't it? But all of it is largely imperceptible. And not only that, but the conditions from spring to summer to harvest, all of that must naturally progress so that the plant is able to thrive in each stage of its development. And so it is with the coming of Christ. God doesn't reveal to us the timing for us, nor does he reveal how close it is, only that it is near, and he calls upon us to be ready. He does, however, make progress toward that goal each and every day. And in that progress or process, he does allow the world to go through all of its seasons and generations so that that judgment day will come and it will dawn at just the right time according to his plan. But see, dear ones, here's the key. The more we trust God's timing and progress, and the more we take that long-term view, the more patient we actually become. So, what do you do when you get stuck waiting for something or somebody? Usually it helps, does it not, to find something to engage our minds in order to help the time pass. In an airport, waiting for a flight, we might play a game on our cell phones or work a a crossword puzzle or maybe chat casually with a friend or a complete stranger. 
Well, as we wait for the return of Christ, God also gives us various activities in order to stay engaged with which to help us remain patient and ready. To be clear, this is not simply busy work that we're talking about here. It's not like the frustrated parent who's giving a bored child and won't be quiet, won't leave them alone because they're trying to accomplish something and they say, here, here's some bubble wrap, start popping until they're all gone. (laughs) Now we could make a long list of different things containing spiritual value that God gives us to spend our time on until Christ returns. However, you notice there in our text that James chooses to focus on a couple of key thoughts. The first is how we deal with other people. And the second is how we deal with pain. So you've got people and you've got pain. Both come into our lives, do they not? And so he's focusing on how we deal with those two things in our daily life and in this sinful world, I might add. Well, it's in connection with people that James reminds us not to get caught up in complaints and grumblings about one another. You might remember the Apostle Paul teaching us that our speech, it is, to be, or it is designed not to tear others down, but it's to build others up. Indeed, that's one of the blessings of our fellowshipping together. You know, after church, when we go into the fellowship hall, we have refreshments and, and, and things like that together. It helps to build us up. It helps to solidify our relationships and our fellowship, as well as that's what happens with all of our church activities. There is spiritual value in those gatherings. And we remember what Paul said to, us, uh, to the Christians there in, in Ephesus as he writes, Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up, that it may benefit those who listen. See, we all have a purpose. We all have a mission, do we not? To be Christ's ambassadors with how we live, how we conduct our lives, and with everyone that we meet, and in doing so to build others up. And see, here's the problem. When we start to complain about another person, especially someone in our own home or in our own church families, we're really doing the exact opposite of what Paul calls upon us to do here. And we end up tearing down our connections with one another. And we're putting distance and separation between each other. James warns us today that that kind of activity is sin. And it invites the judgment of God. Why? Because he's quite serious about it. And as such... If we're going to practice, if we're going to practice patience until the Lord comes back, one of the things that God tells us to do is to spend our time intentionally improving. Let me say that again. Intentionally improving our patience with one another. And when you think about it, that command makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? Why? Because God wants his people to be ready to enter heaven together. And he wants us to be excited about spending eternity with one another, even as we will be with Christ himself. And see, how can I look forward to spending eternity in God's heaven if I'm secretly hoping that you won't be there? Doesn't work, does it? Or how can I thank God for the forgiveness in Christ for me, which is a lot, if there are other people that I don't think he should be forgiving? Or if our thinking becomes kind of twisted and we end up thinking, well, God might forgive them, but I'm not. We know those temptations, don't we? 
these thoughts of anger, exclusion, and disapproval, they actually form the basis of every complaint that comes out of our mouths. And God wants neither those complaining mouths or attitudes to be a part of the people that he's called into his kingdom to live there forever. Now, if that sounds hard, well, you're right, because it is. I maybe mentioned this once to you before. I was talking to a member of a former congregation one day. We were talking about patience and what God says about patience. And he came up to me afterwards and he said, Pastor, if I had any more patience, I'd be a doctor. Okay, Smitty, be a smart aleck. He's in heaven now, so he's having more fun than we are. But all kidding aside, the truth is, patience and the refusing, purposeful refusing to complain about others, that's a constant battle within all of us. As we seek to live lives pleasing to God, and so in fact to live lives, humble lives, with thanksgiving. I say constant battle because you and I both possess a sinful nature still, along with our great enemy, Satan, who loves to feed upon our lack of patience and all of the division that that complaining about each other can bring. I'm telling you, dear ones in Christ, Satan loves it. And part of the reason that he loves it is because when a body of believers, his church, are embroiled and in infighting and complaining and grumbling and whatever it takes our attention as well as our energy off of Christ and our gospel outreach. So, how can our hearts be filled with patience and the humble thanksgiving that Christ desires of his people. Well, God's word encourages us to strengthen our hearts with the truth that he is, in fact, coming again. The Lord is near. And see, that understanding directs uh, us straight to Jesus himself, who already came once to wash away our sins forever. You see, dear ones, as we ponder our Lord, we can't help but recall his humility and mercy as he willingly walked the way to the cross and to his crucifixion. Not to pay for any of his sins. He didn't have any. But it was there on that cross that the sinless Son of God actually became sin for us and ultimately suffered and died to pay for each one of your sins and mine everyone out there as well so that you and I and everyone who believes in him are completely forgiven and in that process see we're made right in order to spend eternity in his heaven it's all his doing and it's all part of his amazing grace toward us. And as we, by faith in the crucified and risen Savior, hold on to that promise of his second coming, we realize that each day brings you and me one step closer to our glorious eternity. And then we come to realize that actually it is our time on earth that's what is growing short. But it's also our time to practice. Practice patience. So that our gospel-inspired patience has a positive impact on the lives of others and perhaps even an eternal impact. And this in turn leads to the realization that our time in heaven where we will live with all of God's people in glorious harmony, that's what's going to last forever. So I want, and I hope that you want to too, to begin practicing 
that peace and that harmony right now. Now, James continues to provide examples, and in doing so, he shifts our reaction to other people to how we react to difficult situations. And so to do that, James brings to mind the difficulties of the Old Testament prophets, and specifically the difficulties of that ancient believer that we know as Job and how he faced those difficulties. Now, with regard to the other Old Testament prophets in general, to be sure, some of their suffering came directly from the hands of rebellious people who refused to listen to these men or offer any kind of comfort whatsoever. But some of that suffering was simply due to their difficult circumstances and painful conditions. Some of that that we're going through even today. But through them, we can endure any and all of them with godly patience. And here again, that long-range view is helpful. In the case of Job, let's think about him for just a moment. You may recall that his suffering went on for many months. And during that time, do you remember what he lost? He lost his property, his family. He lost his health. And his friends, however well in intentioned they might have wanted to be, they simply compounded his suffering by questioning Job's integrity and suggesting that, well, you know what, Job, maybe this is well-deserved punishment from God because of your sins. So how did Job endure all of that? By patiently holding on to God's amazing grace and faithfulness right there, smack dab in the middle of all of his suffering. Now, when I say that, I'm not claiming that all of that was easy for Job to do. I have no doubts that it was difficult because he had a, a sinful nature just like you and me. But what made his hardships easier to bear was Job's focus. And he focused on the characteristics of God rather than on the circumstances swirling around him. Job remembered the same truth that James shares with us today in our text. And that being that the Lord is especially compassionate and merciful. That was the message that strengthened Job's heart and allowed him to practice real and God-inspired patience. Even when he was in pain, physically, emotionally, and in every other way. And see, here we have the advantage over Job, don't we? Because we're on this side of history. God has already shown us his mercy even more clearly in the death and the resurrection of his only son, Jesus. And that's what James is telling us to hold on to today. So that we can be patient until the coming of the Lord. Practice patience as we forgive people around us and as we persevere through our own sufferings, all the while knowing in our heart of hearts that he is coming and he has an incredible eternity in store for each and every one of us. Amen. Please rise for the blessing. And now may the peace of God, which transcends all human understanding, keep your hearts and your minds firmly planted in the risen and the coming Christ. Amen. You may be seated. So at this time then, I invite you to make your presence known through our worship participation cards. And uh, once you have those filled out, then just simply place them in the offering plate in the back of church. 
And so we will continue then with the prayer of the church as printed in your bulletin. Everlasting and merciful God, we pray in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, in mercy, look in mercy upon your church. Protect it and sanctify it by your truth. May your word be taught in its purity and your sacraments be rightly administered. Grant unto your church faithful pastors who shall declare your truth with power and shall live according to your will. Send forth laborers into your harvest field and open the door of faith unto all unbelievers. In mercy, remember the enemies of your church and grant to them repentance unto life. Let your protecting hand be over our country and over all who travel. Prosper what is good among us and bring to nothing every evil counsel and purpose. Protect and bless your servants, the President of the United States, the Governor of this state, our judges, and all in authority. Fit them for their high calling by the gift of your spirit of wisdom and fear, so that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. According to your promise, O God, be the defender of the widow and the father of the orphan. Relieve and comfort the sick and the sorrowful. And hear now, Lord, the prayers that come from the hearts of your people. Lord, we pray that you would continue to provide your healing for your servant Kelly Mears as the pain in her head continues to disrupt her normal activities. Again, give the doctors guidance in determining the cause of the pain and then help them to prescribe the best course of action in making this pain eventually subside. Keep Kelly close to you and embrace her with your incredible love and mercy so that she never questions your presence in her life or your care and compassion for her. And we continue to pray also for Dean's father, Ralph, and ask in your tender care that you would continue to help him in his long road to recovery from his severe burns and loss of toes. Replace any and all frustrations with your incredible peace and joy. And remind Ralph that throughout all of this, that he is your forgiven child and that you have him caringly in your loving arms and will never, ever leave or abandon him. Graciously help those who are assaulted by the devil and who are in peril of death. Be the strength of those who are suffering for the sake of Christ's holy name. Grant that we may live together in peace and prosperity. Bestow upon us good and seasonable weather and bless us with upright Christian counsel in all that we undertake. We especially commend to your care and keeping this, your congregation, which you have bought with a great price. Keep from us all offenses and bind us together in the unity of your holy love. Grant that the little ones who are baptized in your name may be brought up in your fear. At your table, give to those who there commune with you peace and life everlasting. Be merciful, O God, to all according to your great love in Christ Jesus our Lord. When our blessed hour shall come, grant us a blessed departure from this world and on the last day, a resurrection to your glory. And now we pray together as he has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, 
but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. For our closing hymn, let us turn to hymn 96. As we sing together, hark, a thrilling voice is sounding. Very good. Well, thank you for joining us here again this morning. Uh, we hope that, in fact, you have been strengthened in your faith through the proclamation of God's Word, and also that you do find blessings in, and encouragement and comfort in the fellowship of fellow believers. Thank, thank you, Nancy, for providing our music for our worship today. Thank you, Mary. Sorry I didn't give you much of an introduction to come up here. But uh, uh, we appreciated that, and I think that particular song really uh, sounds beautiful on your instrument. Uh, so a big thanks to both of you uh, for blessing our worship. By way of announcements, you can see those that are listed there in your bulletin. Of course, everyone is invited uh, right after church for our fellowship coffee hour and so forth uh, together in the fellowship hall. Also, our Dayspring Academy will be having a Christmas program here uh, uh, this Tuesday evening at 6.30, and everyone is certainly welcome to that. Thursday, we have the elders meeting at 6.30, followed by uh, the council meeting. And then uh, Linda wanted it to be sure that everyone who bid on the silent auction items should uh, uh, pick them up today, right? Uh, and uh, yeah, pick them up. I was going to emphasize pay for them too, but that's just a given, right? Yeah, anyway. And also there's a giving tree. I noticed that most of them are gone, but on the back of you're in the back of church there. If you want to grab one of those things, there's various items that could be used here, and uh, that would be wonderful. I guess you just leave it at the uh, church office uh, once you bring them in. All right, and uh, there is a sign-up sheet for... Uh, providing uh, poinsettias that we have here uh, in our uh, sanctuary and a number of other things on that back table as well. And then please note our holiday services as Linda has put that there in the little square. We'll meet together here December 24th, Christmas Eve for our candlelight uh, service. And then, um, you know, at, uh, Christmas as well as New Year's Day comes on a Sunday this year. So we'll be meeting on Christmas Day here at 9 a.m. There's no Bible class or Sunday school on that day. And then the same thing the next week for January 1. We meet here 
at uh, 9 o'clock, and we don't have uh, Sunday school or adult Bible class. Any other announcements, Linda, that need to be made? Okay. Anybody have anything else that didn't get mentioned? All right. Well, with that then, uh, may God bless your daily walk with him. Amen.